No, 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 no. T I G E R S. Fight, 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 fight. Mike, it's not even a top a thousand moment all time. Okay, Tommy, shut the hell up, man. Mike. Oh, of course, he... I'm gonna go with the right answer. It's Ryan Eads of the Baltimore Orioles. He only he's only wore the number eighty for uh, oh. eight games. He's only one of two players. You know what? No, no, I'm not gonna take this. <laughs> Welcome back to Go Chat. Today we have a huge episode lined up. The MLB trade deadline was absolutely ridiculous. We got Russell Westbrook trade in the NBA. The NBA draft was awesome. I mean, all the free agent sign- signings for the NHL have been insane as well. So there's so much to go over today. So let's get right into it. First off, with the go to the number 96, Matt, I'm going to swing it to you first. Who do you got? Uh, for the girl in number 96, I'm going to go with Cortez Kennedy. Not a lot of choices here for 96, but when I found Cortez Kennedy, he just made it all easy. Eight-time Pro Bowler, three-time All-Pro, uh, Hall of Fame, All-1990s team, 1990, uh, AP Defensive Player of the Year, excuse me, and he's got a Hall of Fame on his belt. Uh, this guy's got a lot of accolades, and he's just been – doing amazing and he did amazing for the seattle seahawks back in the day so he's gonna have to be the go to number 96 for me good pick there good pick there connor what about you yeah i'm gonna agree with matt and go cortez kennedy he was <laughs> all the accolades uh 58 career sacks mm-hmm. you know that's not anywhere close to um those top levels that we've been naming for defensive ends but cortez kennedy was a defensive tackle he had 569 career tackles um eight-time pro bowl three-time all pro defensive player of the year under his belt Definitely a great big piece there, part of that uh, Seattle defense. They're in the, the middle of that front line for a long time. I'm going to go Cortez Kennedy as well. Yeah, I think I'm going to agree with you guys here. He was just <laughs> a really good pass rushing defensive end who was also able to stop the run. Obviously, his dominant season, 92, where he won defensive player of the year, had 14 sacks. Um, other than that, he never hit double-digit sacks, but his sack numbers were always um, respectable. I just want to give a shout out to Pavel Burite. I mean, he only won, he only wore 96 for two years, but this is really the only chance I'll get to talk to him. He was a huge part um, of the Florida Panthers when they were an expansion team coming into uh, the league. He was a big reason why they made the finals that one year and have not been back since. But I just want to give a big shout out to him. He's a Hall of Famer, fantastic goal scorer, and uh, quite the character as well. So, Pavel Burry, I'll give a shout out, but once again, it's Cortez Kenny for me. I didn't think we had Tommy on the episode today, but then we're mentioning players who only won the number for two years, and it seems like we've got Tommy right there in the corner. Well, well to be fair, he is a Hall of Famer, one of the better hockey players of all time. Hockey. Why did I say hockey? Anyways, yeah, that's why. So, he wore it for two years. Like, <laughs> I understand. I just want to give him a shout out, okay? God. All um, right. Any I other- think that's going to wrap up this short go number segment. Let's get right into our acquisition talk. <laughs> Welcome back to Go Chat. And we are now in the month of August, which means the trade deadline in the MLB has came and went. And boy, it was probably the craziest one I've seen since I've been a real fan of the, of the sport. But trades weren't only happening in MLB. We saw a huge trade happened in the NBA just a couple days before the uh, the draft and a bunch of draft day trades there in the NBA as well. We'll get into that in just a little bit, but I think we should start with the MLB trade deadline here. And I mean, we have so many star names, all-star player names traded here. I mean, Javi Baez is now a man. Matt, Joey Gallo and Anthony Rizzo are Yankees. Starlin Marte, who practically gets traded every trade deadline, is back in Oakland with the Athletics. I mean, Matt, I'm going to throw it to you first here. I mean, I know you're not the biggest baseball fan. Oh, Connor, but- Connor, I know everything right now. Don't don't say that, Connor. I know every- I'm not like you with hockey where you say that every time it starts. I know <laughs> this stuff right now. What what do you think was the biggest trade? Not necessarily the most impactful for the team, but what was the biggest trade in the MLB? Oh, hands down, the Dodgers trade to get Max Scherzer and Trey Turner. I mean, the Dodgers last year, they won the World Series. We know that. And they were a top favorite coming into this year. We saw that. And, you know, if we look at the MLB standings right now, they're competing with the San Francisco Do- uh, Giants are in their division. They're competing with them. So they need to get over the hump over San Francisco and over all those NL teams. They bring in a guy like Max Scherzer to put on that pitching rotation that is 
already amazing in my opinion. Um, and you get a guy like Trey Turner. I mean, I was thinking the other day at shortstop, you have Trey Turner and Corey Seager. I had no idea what, what's going to happen there, how they're going to utilize them in the lineup, but still Trey Turner is a fast, fast player. He's one of my favorite players. Um, He's very good defensively, and he we know that he can hit the ball. I mean, on, on his birthday uh, a few months back, he got that uh, – what, what's it called when you get the first you, – you get first base, second base, you know, the like cycle. the cycle. He got a cycle on his birthday, I'm pretty sure it was. So we know Trey Turner is a very fantastic player, and we know guaranteed that Max Scherzer is a great player, two Nationals greats that won the World Series a couple years ago. So if I had to say what's the biggest <clears> – <throat> It was that trade because that put that puts the Dodgers over the hump, over the NL teams, and, and a good chance to two P in my opinion at this point. Mike, what move was most surprising for you? What what do you what move did you not think was going to happen, and then it did, or the lack of, or you thought, or we thought it was going to happen, and it didn't. The most surprising move, I think, <clears throat> the the Max Trey Turner trade is definitely up there. Um, I mean, that, that trade was absolutely a, a bombshell coming uh, out of nowhere. But, uh, yeah, that trade was absolutely ridiculous. Um, the most surprising move, I think, has to be Anthony Rizzo to the Yankees. Obviously, Joe, Joey Gallo um, was expected, right? But uh, I think Anthony Rizzo to the Yankees, when they already had Luke Voigt, and they ended up not trading Luke Voigt anyways, they weren't able to get – a deal done. So I think Anthony Rizzo to the Yankees was um, very surprising. Yeah. You know, when I think about the biggest trade, the question that I asked Matt, it's definitely Scherzer and Turner. I mean, you're adding two all-star players. I mean, potential Cy Young and I mean, Trey Turner is, he's still young in the league. He, he could get that MVP under the belt. He's very good and he's very consistent. So, I mean, you're adding two perennial, perennial threats to your team every single year. And how many more do they need? I mean, they still got Cody Ballinger, who is struggling quite a bit this year, but you got Mookie Betts, Corey Seager. I mean, just so many great, great players that are on the Dodgers. Um, the move that I thought was the most surprising, and I'm actually going to say the move that didn't happen, was that Trevor Story is still a Colorado Rocky. I thought for sure, I mean, the Colorado Rockies were, I thought they were going to be the team that was the most in some mode, not necessarily the Chicago Cubs or the um, – what was the other team that traded every single player? Nationals. The Nationals, right. And, I mean, I, I thought for sure that the Rockies were going to be the team that was all about selling, 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 get rid of Trevor Story, you know, send him to New York, whether it be the, the Yankees or the Mets, send him over to, to San Francisco that's in a, a NL West um, division race. Get, get him somewhere so and you get some great prospects back because, I mean, everyone knows who, who, how good Trevor Story is in the MLB. So I was definitely shocked to see that after that 4 o'clock deadline passed on July 31st, he was – or not July 31st, um, that last Friday, that he was still a Colorado Rocky. Yeah, I mean, I, I thought the Mets were going to pursue Trevor Story. Uh, obviously, the Mets should, did get Javier Baez um, on that trade deadline. But uh, I don't know. I thought Trevor Story, he would have been a trade deadline. He would have been dealt by the trade deadline. Kind of shocked to not see him go. But uh, a lot of big names. I am I am shocked myself to see all these big names get traded. I, I was shocked. To, well, I heard about rumors about Max Scherzer being traded. I was shocked to see it. Just completely shocked. And then adding Trey Turner into that. He's He's 28 years old. And I mean, at worst, he's a top five shortstop, like for someone's opinion. So, you know, um, moving over to, to the Dodgers, he's in COVID-19 protocol right now, so he can't play yet. But he, we might see him at second base or, or Corey Seager we might see at second base. I'm not sure. But a lot of a lot of deals here that have shocked me. I mean, um, that Max Scherzer, uh, his, that last couple hours of that trade deadline, it was crazy because you had Ken Rosenthal saying – that the Padres were close on finalizing a deal. And then you had, uh, it was someone else, I don't recognize, remember the name, who said that the Giants were close on closing a deal. And then in swoops the Dodgers, and then they add Trey Turner too. It, it was it was crazy. It was a crazy couple days in the MLB. You couldn't put your phone down. You had to constantly be, be refreshing Twitter to find the next big deal. Every deal was happening within seconds of each other. 
And the Dodgers gave up a haul. I mean, they gave up two of their top three prospects in uh, Jos- Josiah Gray. And uh, I forgot the other guy's name, Calvert, Calvert something, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, but uh, Kybert, Kybert Cruz. He's Ruiz. Ruiz. Or Ruiz, Ruiz, not Cruz. Yeah. I mean, he, he's, he's another phenomenal prospect. And I think they got two other top 15-ish prospects, I think, as well. And with the story thing, <clears throat> I saw a report saying that uh, what the Rockies were going to get back for Trevor Story at the trade deadline – was not worth the compensation pick that they're going to get next year um, if he signs a massive contract, um, which is probably what he's going to do. So I understand that thinking, you know, the the pick will probably be in the top 15-ish or somewhat. Um, It was really weird. Some of the halls were absolutely huge, but some of the other halls for Chris Bryant, number nine prospect in the, San Francisco system and just an, just another guy in the minors. I thought that was a great deal for the San Francisco Giants. Um, in terms of the Mets with Javier Baez, I think they gave they gave up a really good prospect, but he's a high school player who hasn't played in the minors leagues yet because he had uh, shoulder shoulder surgery on his non throwing arm. So he's another guy that is very valuable, but. They did get Javier Baez, and hopefully they can uh, extend him. So, I mean, just so many so many different moves. Um, but, Connor, who do you think ha- is a winner coming out of this trade deadline? I don't want to sound biased here, but I have to say the Yankees. They, I mean, they added two bullpen pieces. Granted, the ERAs, career ERAs on those two bullpen pieces may not be the best. I'm not going to say them because I'm, I'm just not – but, I mean, you needed lefty bats there. You needed lefty bats, and they got them. Joey Gallo, you, you know what you're going to get from Joey Gallo. You're going to get 200 strikeouts a year, but you're looking to get 40 home runs. If he's going to hit 220 over or 220 batting average with 40 home runs and help you win some games, the Yankees are going to be happy. With a short porch there and right field at Yankee Stadium, Joey Gallo is going to mash. And we saw Anthony Rizzo. He's been a Yankee for – for two games, we're recording this on Sunday, and he's four for five with two home runs, two walks, five runs scored, and five RBIs. I mean, he's mashing the ball right now, and, you know, I saw something on Twitter, and it really resonated. The, the Anthony Rizzo deal, it, it's kind of like that Mark Desher deal that the Yankees made back in 2009, bringing him in as, in as a free agent, lefty bat. You know, Mark Desher was a switch hitter. We had that lefty bat there in Yankee Stadium, a first baseman who can mash the ball. I, and it really resonated well with me. I think Anthony Rizzo can can be a great first baseman piece there for a long time. You know, who knows what happens when Luke Voigt comes back. He's slated to come back very soon. You move one of them to DH. You're going to have to have Giancarlo Stanton playing in the outfield if that's going to be some sort of liability. You have no idea. You know, he played there on, a, on Friday night. He played out there in the outfield, and I didn't hear anything bad, so I guess nothing bad really happened. Um, one thing with the Yankees though, that really scared me was, I think it was, it it was Wednesday night. They were playing in Tampa Bay and they scratched Aaron judge from the lineup. He was caught in traffic when they scratched him from the lineup. I was like, Oh my God, Aaron judge is being traded. I thought for sure that Aaron judge was being dealt because they scratched him from the lineup 20 minutes before it was sent in. And I, I was so convinced I, I was walking around my house. I was like, if Aaron judge gets traded from the New York Yankees, I'm not a Yankees fan. I'm not. And I don't think you would understand the amount of backlash that Brian Cashman would get if he traded Aaron Judge the way he did. Luckily, he didn't. But I have to say that the Yankees are winners here, getting getting two lefty bats. You know, they also added Andrew Heaney from the Angels. You know, he's not having a very good year. He's got over a four ERA this year, but he's a lefty pitcher. You know, he'll probably throw him into the bullpen. He's he's a starting pitcher there in L.A., but he'll probably play in the bullpen there. Um, yeah. And yeah, the Yankees, they, they made deals that they had to make. Matt, who's your winner? The Dodgers. I mean, <laughs> I think that's the, the that's kind of an easy easy cop out, but I, I I don't know how you really don't say the Dodgers are winners here. Like I said, they they needed a pitcher. Dustin May out for the year. Trevor Bauer, we don't know if he's going to pitch again. Uh, Julio Urias, he's been pitching a ton for them. Um, so that what they really needed to bring in was a starting pitcher, and then. 
it's Max Scherzer. I mean, he's 36 years old, but still playing amazing. He's got a 2.76 ERA, 34% strikeout rate. Um, so when you bring in Max Scherzer to your team, it obviously is going to help you. And like I said, they got to get over that hump. And then, of course, the addition of trade Herder too. I don't need to go on. I, I think I just rebuttal what I said before. Um, I, I think both the Yankees and Dodgers made huge moves here at the deadline, but I just got to go with the Dodgers here. I mean, just the combination of both Max Scherzer and Trey Turner, apparently they're going to put Turner at second instead of Corey Seager, who isn't the best defender, which uh, confuses me. But none, nonetheless, they have both them in their lineup for um, – this year Max Scherzer still playing at an elite level at 36 like you mentioned Matt and I mean just the Dodgers I just want to give a shout out to the Dodgers ownership for their commitment to winning this offseason they win the World Series and they go sign a pitcher to the largest per year deal in MLB history then when he gets when that happens with uh, Trevor Bauer they go out and they trade for Max Scherzer and Trey Turner they are willing to spend the big bucks well other teams in big markets like the Yankees and the Mets are scared to go over the luxury tax. So shout out to him. And of course the Yankees are big winners as well with Joey Gallo and Anthony Rizzo. Both those lefty bats are going to help tremendously, but I'm a little nervous about Stanton playing left field. He didn't play left field for 690 plus days. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I didn't watch the game that he played left field. I'm sure it was fine. I'm sure nothing significant happened but I'm sure they'd rather have someone else out there besides Stanton and have Stanton DHing. But uh, n- nonetheless, they got two big bats there. I would have liked to see either the Mets or the Yankees get some pitching, but the price on pitching was so high with Barrios going to the Blue Jays for a phenomenal prospect uh, from Vanderbilt. And obviously the Scherzer deal was massive. But other than that, I mean, the Dodgers and the Yankees, huge winners. Uh, this trade deadline Mike post post trade deadline are the Giants a playoff team yeah the Giants are a playoff team I, mm-hmm. I think that 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 Chris Bryant accusation was huge you know and and it came super late in at the trade deadline I think it was processed and sent through at like 3 55 p.m like you know five minutes before the end of the trade deadline he was he was suited up suited up in his his Chicago Cubs gear, he was ready to go out and start his warm-up there in Chicago. He was like, wow, I, I, he made it through, didn't get traded. He, would do, he would have been the last piece there in, in Chicago. And then he gets <laughs> the phone call that he's been traded to, traded to the Giants. It, it's a huge move for them. You know, they've been playing baseball out of their mind this entire, entire season. You know, you got Buster Posey playing the top of his game. Brandon Crawford seems like he's back to prime Brandon Crawford. He's playing great. Um, yeah, and Chris Bryant there. I mean, Giants are for real. Yeah, I mean, he's he's been slumping a little bit recently, hitting 190 the last month. But uh, he's going to help that lineup, no doubt. And I think the Padres and the Giants are pretty much a lock for the NL wild card right now. Um, so if, if you want to make the playoffs, just win your division. You have n- no other hope. Um, but, Matt, I'm sorry, what, what were you going to say? Did you see the video of Chris Bryant when he got the call? Yeah, that was, that was kind of sad. That was yeah. pretty sad. It was pretty sad, but still, the, the Giants, that was a great accusation, in my opinion. You know, Buster Posey didn't play last year because of COVID. He opted out. Now he's playing amazing, and, and the Giants are up there. So the addition of Chris Bryant will be interesting to see. But, yeah, they're definitely a lock for the uh, NL wild card there with the Padres and the Giants with the Dodgers uh, at the top. Quick question. What do we think about the Cubs and the Nationals getting rid of almost half their starting lineup? Do, is it is it a good move to go all in with the tank, even though with the Nationals you still have a guy like Juan Soto, top five to ten player in the, in the league, one of the best hitters um, in the league as of right now. And with the Cubs, all of those guys on expiring contracts, is it smart for them to go all in with uh, selling the big the big leaguers and trying to boost the farm? What do you guys think, Connor? I'll swing it to you first. I'd say yes, and you know the reason for this is. Baseball is a much different sport looking down the line than, than football or basketball, you know, football or basketball, football, you have 16 or now 17 games in the season. You gotta, you gotta put everything into those 17 games. I mean, baseball is 162 games and you've got your farm systems for a reason, you know, and 
when you're not going to win and you know you're not going to win this year and you're looking to get prospects back like um, what the Dodgers – or what the uh, – oh, my gosh, the Nationals got back in Josiah Gray and and Cabert Ruiz. I mean, Cabert Ruiz is a great catcher, you know. He'll, he'll fit in really well there. Josiah Gray is a hard-throwing, hard-throwing starting pitcher. I mean, when you want to get those prospects back and you're looking – at from from the management perspective on on baseball, you're looking two to three years down the line now. If if you're not winning this year, you're looking two three years down the line. But you want to keep Juan Soto there because he's your piece. He's your piece. You know, Chicago they they had their pieces there in 2016 when they broke the curse and won the World Series championship. But other than that, they really haven't done too much uh, as far as winning and getting back towards championship rings. So. They had to deal them that way, but they got a lot of great prospects back. You know, they got San Francisco Giants number seven prospect. I I, I like it. I, I I think it is the right move to make if you're not in a winning situation this year. Matt, what do you think? Obviously, you know, Nationals, casual Nationals fan. I'm not going <laughs> to like I'm a huge fan. It still sucks to see those guys leave, um, see them get traded, especially Trey Turner. <laughs> A guy I watched uh, at Syracuse through their farm system, um, you know, Bryce, Bryce Harper was a, a little, you know, Bryce Harper even sucked a little um, when I saw him get, uh, he didn't get traded. He signed with the uh, Phillies, but I mean, Hey, if, if it's smart, then it's smart. I'm not entirely sure how long it takes a team to rebuild. I just hope they don't waste Juan Soto when he's really good. That's, so that's all I hope is because Juan Soto is a one of a kind player. And when he's at his prime, which, you know, I, I think he's going to be coming up into his prime um, and he's, he's going to last in his prime a little while. But I just hope that they don't waste tons of Juan Soto. I know he already has a World Series ring uh, when they won two years ago, but still, you don't want to waste a type of talent like that guy. Yeah, man. I mean, I, I agree with you. He's only 22 now. He has possibly 15 more years left in his major league career. He started off when he was 19, winning the World Series with the with the Nationals and really broke out the, the year after. But uh, I think it, it was definitely smart for the Cubs because all those guys were on expiring contracts. You weren't going to extend them. Um, you you might have been able to make a wild card or <clears throat> make a push for the NL Central, right? But that was unlikely unless you gave up some, some of your farm. And all those guys that you just trade by as Rizzo and Brian, they all said that they're open to returning after this season, you know? And so you could pretty much just steal them back kind of what uh, Chapman did with the Yankees where the Yankees trade Chapman to Chicago, got a world series. Then you sign him back in New York. Um, I doubt that that's what they're going to do, but it's smart move for the Cubs to kind of blow it up when they had their backs against the wall in terms of the nationals. They weren't uh, the best team. They, they were playing better, but I don't think you should have gotten rid of Trey Turner. I think he was still a young piece that you could pair next to Juan Soto and still um, built for the future with uh, your other guys and stuff like that. Your, their prospect system wasn't bad. Obviously it's a lot better now, but I still think you got to keep Trey Turner there. I don't really know what the Nationals were thinking besides sell the whole team besides Juan Soto. But uh, I, I, the Schwarber deal was fine to Boston. Scherzer, you sent him to L.A. Maybe you just get Josiah Gray or Caber Ruiz back instead of both of them, right? But who knows? Who, who knows what would have happened? I would have liked to see them keep Trey Turner. I'm glad they got rid of Trey Turner as a Mets fan, but – um, that's what I think from both sides of the coin. You know, I mentioned when we came into this segment that there was a lot of, a lot of deals happening, not just in the MLB. I think this is a good time to transition over. Um, we saw Russell Westbrook get dealt in the NBA. He is now a Los Angeles Laker there with Anthony Davis and LeBron James. I also see that they're incredibly interested in signing Carmelo Anthony there in that Lakers organization. Matt, I'm going to throw it to you first. Um, are the Lakers feeling the pressure that they have to go out and win again next year? Yeah, I think they're feeling the pressure that they need to win. They're in a win now situation. You know, LeBron is however old he is. I've lost track. Connor, you might know. 36? 30, 37. 37 or 38. 
All right. So LeBron is 38. Let's not sugarcoat it. He's got probably Six, my bad. 36. He's probably got five more years in the league at most, in my opinion. Maybe, maybe a little more depending on the injuries. Or maybe a little less depending on the injuries. Maybe a little more depending on how much he feels that, you know, he if this guy becomes Tom Brady 2.0. Um, but Lakers are in a win now situation. They want to get LeBron the most that they could give him, you know. Um, and Anthony Davis pairing him too. Anthony Davis is still a good player, and you want to utilize him as much as you can before he falls off because we've seen a lot of big men fall off before because of injuries because of a lot of things but Anthony Davis is still at the the not the peak but he's still in his prime um so yeah I think they felt the pressure and they really need to get that third guy out and when you look at teams like the Nets they got a big three and you look at teams that are just getting better the Bucks I mean we talked about the Bucks there last week you know they got Chris Middleton Drew Holiday Giannis you look at those teams and the Lakers, I think, needed a little push to get them over. And they really want to come back and win the, the title next year. And I'm excited to see what they can do. Mike, does Russell Westbrook fit with the Los Angeles Lakers scheme? No. I mean, I, I understand the Lakers philosophy here that they're just trying to get as much talent as they can. I mean, their window is slamming shut now. I feel like um, Father Time is really knocking at LeBron's door and we saw, we saw that last year at the end of the season the playoffs I'm sure he's going to come back and look much better with a full offseason program and uh, full offseason to rest and recover but I mean it just I don't think it was a smart move at all I mean they could have pursued Mike Conley in free agency um, Kyle Lowry would have been a phenomenal fit in LA I think that would have been a much better player that you can say I need you to facilitate the ball when LeBron's off the court. And of course, Russell Westbrook can do that. But when all three of them are on the court together, I, I just think it's a horrible fit. I mean, obviously, the Lakers have so much to do this offseason. They only have five players under contract right now. I think they still have Drummond and Taylor and Horn Tucker. So right now, you have a starting five of Westbrook, Horn Tucker, LeBron, Anthony Davis, uh, Andre oh. Drummond. That, what? They have Gasol. I don't think they have Drummond, though. Oh, okay. Okay, so, so Gasol and Seth Drummond, I, I don't know, especially with a bench that hasn't been filled out yet with Russell Westbrook making 40-plus million a year. You have little cap space left. I just don't like the move. Obviously, they got value for Westbrook. They didn't give up much to get him, but I would have loved to see Kyle Lowry or even Lonzo Ball, Mike Conley. There, there were so many other fits. The spacing is going to be so poor. You know, I, I guess you're sacrificing spacing for putting pressure on the rim. But, I mean, you just got to go out and get shooters right now. LeBron was the best when he was surrounded by shooters. Cleveland, you had J.R. Smith, Kyle Korver, Kevin Love, right? Kyrie Irving was able to shoot the ball. In Miami, I understand that a lot of people are saying Russell Westbrook has a similar skill set to Dwayne Wade. But you still had Chris Bosh, who was able to shoot the three. Um, Shane Battier, Mike Miller, Mario Chalmers. I mean – a lot of guys in Miami that were able to shoot the ball besides Dwayne and LeBron. So it, it, it all depends on what the Lakers are able to do. I mean, if they pick up like Seth Curry or something like that, then sure. Yeah. This fits better. But as of right now, bad, bad move for the Lakers. So Mike, are you saying this, that this in your eyes is a bad trade for the Lakers? I just think that there are so many better options. Obviously it's all contingent on. Was it a bad trade? As of right now, yes. I think Russell Westbrook can do good. You know, I think he's a facilitator who can crash the boards, and he's going to be able to score points. You, you, they felt the pressure. You know, they didn't. They were out in the first round of the playoffs last year. They they need to be able to be that that team. You know, LeBron isn't used to to sitting at home watching the finals. He's used to being there, winning the finals, or or taking part in them, and he. And I think the Lakers organization definitely felt pressure. No, I said it on here just a couple of weeks ago. It might have even been last week. That in my eyes now, Michael Jordan is the the go to basketball because LeBron's LeBron's resume has taken a major hit since he's been he's been in LA. You know, his first year there, they missed the playoffs. Second year, they won the championship. But third year, he's out first round of the playoffs. It's taken a big hit since he's been there. I think they definitely needed to make a move to get more pieces there. You know, Anthony Davis is still going to put up close to 30 a game 
LeBron's still going to be able to put up 25 to 30 a game. When you have Russell Westbrook there, who's going to be trying to, to make great passes and crash the boards and still be able to score. You know, he may not be the best shooter. He may not be able to shoot a great three ball. He may not be able to have a great, a great mid range jumper, but he's a great slasher in the NBA. He's going to be able to get to the paint and be able to score there and get his and one opportunities. He's going to be able to be okay on the defensive side of the ball. You know, I, I, I think he's, I think he's going to be a good piece to the Lakers. You know, I didn't think the team, it made the team any worse I think you're just adding another great player. You, you know, you said that you don't think the three are going to mend well. I just think in Brooklyn, you know, we saw we saw Harden, Irving, and Durant. And, you know, they were really never on the court together because one of them was always hurt or whatever. So you, you can say that they didn't really mend well, so to speak, great right there in Brooklyn. I just I, – I, th- I think this is a good move for the Lakers. I think they felt the pressure, and I think they capitalized on, on what they could have got. I mean, that, that's a totally different situation in Brooklyn. They, they – really didn't get a chance to play together because one was hurt or two of them were hurt at the same time. So I think that's uh, a totally different um, situation. But one thing I, I just want to throw out there is that um, you said Russ was an okay defender. I think I think he's a pretty good defender just based on how much effort he brings to every game, every night. And that's why he's one of my favorite players in the NBA. Um, he's just He just gives it 110% every night. And I'm going to be curious to see what happens when LeBron is complaining with the ref about a foul call and he doesn't hustle back on defense multiple possessions in a row. Is Russ going to get on his get on his back and really uh, bark at him? I'm, I'm just I'm just uh, curious to see that dynamic and how that works out. And if um, LeBron is going to play up to Russ's effort level standards, because I don't think Russ is going to be willing to take any of that BS throughout the season, especially if you're in the playoffs. I think what Russell Westbrook brings to the Lakers team, which I'm excited to see and why I think it might mend well, is the Lakers relied so much on LeBron last year. They were creating shots for himself and other people. Um, so when LeBron, he's not superhuman. He's not playing the whole game. When he checks out, you bring in uh, Russell Westbrook to come in, and Russell Westbrook can – score the ball we know that he'll be a threat to the opposing defense they didn't have that this year they had Dennis Schroeder who come on Dennis Schroeder was insanely inconsistent this whole year and he's not Russell Westbrook so I think when Russell Westbrook comes in that can help them I think they could also push the tempo again with a guy like Russell Westbrook Um, and you know Russell Westbrook's not the first option he's not the second option he's the third option so I think Russell Westbrook can kind of take a back seat. He's a triple double machine. We know that. Um, so I think he could take a back seat and kind of move the ball around. I think it's going to be a totally new type of Russell Westbrook's game. I think he's going to have to kind of be taught a little of how he has to be. And I think it's going to be fine because Russell Westbrook obviously came here for, was recruited here for a reason. And that's because LeBron. I'll tell you one thing, uh, the GM, I don't think made that move, to be honest. I think LeBron really uh, was the one behind the scenes making those that move to get Russell Westbrook. So I think they already have good chemistry off the court. You know, they're, they're friends. We know that they, they've hung out with each other. So I think LeBron is really going to teach Russell Westbrook about what his role is here. And I think that they're going to be a team that is going to be really tough to be when they're at their best. You know, I truly believe that Russell Westbrook's going to to know his role and be able to play in the role. You know, Russell Westbrook, he's been a great player in the NBA for for years, yet he doesn't have that that championship ring that every player in the NBA looks for. And I think he knows that going to L.A., being with Anthony Davis and LeBron and a great, great core of players that they're going to be able to sign around them. I, I, I think he knows that that ring is a real possibility Um for that team, you know, he got so close there in Oklahoma City in 2013 that when they lost in the finals. I, I think he's going to understand that that ring is within his grasp this year, and I think he's going to do whatever he can and play whatever role he can within the Lakers organization to be able to get that ring for himself. Oh, yeah. It's his last chance to get a ring, and I think he knows that. He's been on three different t- – four different teams, excuse me. It's his time. This, this is his time to get a ring. And it's his, I think it's his last chance, to be honest, unless he goes to another super team that is just insane at the age of, like, when he's older. 
Mike, do you have a final comment on Russell Westbrook? Yeah, I was just going to mention, I feel kind of bad for him. You know, he spent his whole, pretty much his whole career in OKC, then he gets traded three off seasons in a row. It's really weird seeing him in all these different uniforms. But my only question is, is he going to accept that role? I know you guys mentioned that this is really his last shot at a title, but we've seen in Houston, he started to accept the role a little bit, but then he would always revert back to him chucking up the ball. And obviously he still f- facilitates, but he still has poor shot selection in Washington. Um, we still uh, saw him take poor shot selection um, come playoff time. So that's my only question. If Russell Westbrook, you know, accepts his role and is purely a facilitator and scores um, when he has the opportunity to, and, uh, and kind of like what he did in stretches in Houston and Washington, then I think this might be able to work out, but I just don't see Russell Westbrook accepting that role more than 20 or 30 games at a time. And I think the difference here is LeBron is telling him to. So when LeBron is telling him, to, telling you to, listen, Russ, I, I really hope he doesn't think he's better than LeBron. I, I'll tell you that. I have no clue, but I really hope he doesn't think he's better than LeBron. I, I, I could see him thinking he's better than James Harden. I could see him thinking he's better than Bradley Beal or players he's other played with. But this is LeBron James telling you what to do, and I think that it's going to be a whole, totally different thing. I, when LeBron is telling you to do something – Nobody's better than him in the league. Nobody can say they are truly better than him. Other than, you know, Kate. Right now, KD is, but like, are you really going to argue with LeBron because how great he's been? Um, but you can't, he's got to accept it. It's, it's at this point. And I think that Russell Westbrook, how they're friends, you know, how we've seen them off court, you know, talking. Um, I think that he's going to learn to accept this because it's LeBron telling you to do it you know that's a fair point that's a fair point go, go ahead no I, I that's that's pretty much all i have to say that that's a fair no, point I still, I still think russ is gonna revert to, to his old self somewhat come playoff time i hope i'm wrong I, I hope he you know succeeds in la but we'll see what happens you know matt mentioned a name that's been in the uh the nba headlines as well and i'll i'll just touch on this really fast before i let you guys talk about some nhl uh, signings, but Bradley Beal has formally requested a trade from the Washington Wizards. Um, so who do you, where do you think he ends up? He did. When did he request it? Was it was it? a couple days ago. Uh, his, I, his landing destinations were the Golden State Warriors, Miami Heat, or there was one other team. Boston, I'm pretty sure. Philly, I'm pretty sure. It, it, I'm, I'm no, not not even saying that as like a Celtic. As, as like a Celtics fan, I think that was it was legitimately Boston. He's he's like best friends with Jason Tatum. Well, where where do you see him ending up? God, I mean, I don't know. I, I still think he has an inkling to stay in DC. He loves it there for some reason. Um, <laughs> I I could see him with Boston. I just don't I just don't see any trade package going down um, where Boston sends Jalen Brown and I don't like where Boston accepts an offer where they send Jalen Brown. I don't see the Wizards accepting an offer without Jalen Brown. So that's kind of the, the dynamic there. I could definitely see the Heat. Um, the Heat need a scoring guard. And same with the Sixers. I think he'd be a phenomenal fit in Philadelphia. Um, if I'm Philadelphia, I'm, I'm asking Washington right now, one for one, straight up, Brad Beal for Ben Simmons. And if they accept that, Hallelujah. I mean, you're you're in line for a title contention right now with Tobias Harris, Joel Embiid, and Brad Beer, Brad Beal. That's a phenomenal lineup right there. And if Philadelphia can pull that off, they're, they're a title contender for sure. What do you think, Matt? I think he's staying in Washington, to be honest. I mean, we saw Washington with this trade. I don't think he's going to go and stay. I'll tell you that much. And I don't think I think that's been knocked down um, in the recent with the recent draft you know warriors really could he really could have done something with the draft having the pick seven and 14 but uh, i think the wizards he's going to stay there because they just got kyle kuzma they got kcp um who else did, they got montrez harrell they got um did they get anyone else no whoever the 22 overall pick was i don't know who it was they dealt that too um 
But they brought in Aaron Holiday because of the draft on a draft day trade. They got Corey Kisper, who could really shoot the ball. He's from Gonzaga. I just don't see them really trading Bradley Beal because it's kind of like a Washington Nationals situation, how they're not trading Juan Soto. I don't think you trade Bradley Beal because he's your centerpiece of this team. He's the pure star of the team. You trade Bradley Beal, depending on what you get, I don't know if it's going to be a pure star, but I just don't see the 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 improvement by trading him here. I mean, you will have to see who they get. I mean, the, the Heat, I have no clue who they'd give up, to be honest. Um, the Sixers, you, they'd probably be giving up Ben Simmons, uh, Shake Milton, maybe Matisse Dybul, maybe or Furkan Korkmaz is one of those players. A uh, package there and first round pick next year or two first round picks. I just don't. And, and if and Bradley Beal goes to 76ers, what are the what are those first round picks? They're they're late first round picks in that case. So I don't see the Wizards really trading Bradley Beal. I don't think there's a really going to be a really enticing option for him. I th- I think if they do, I don't think they're looking to compete. I think they're looking for to tank. So I think they're looking, they're, they're going to be looking for young players in return. So that's why I mentioned Miami is one still have Tyler hero. Um, we don't really know what's going to happen with Duncan Robinson and come near none this off season as they're both um, free agents, but they get throwing a uh, precious Chua in there. Who is a nice uh, center that could come off the bench for you that could potentially start in the future and throwing some uh, first round picks there. Who knows if the, um, how much the heat are going to, how good they are going to be. Um, in the next coming years. I don't so, think the Heat know how good they're going to be in the next yeah. coming years. They exactly. were in the NBA Finals in the bubble, and this year, you know, they were up and down all year. You know, the bubble was a completely – we saw the Suns go undefeated in there and still managed to miss the playoffs. Um, but the bubble was completely different. You, you, you have no idea how good the Heat or bad the Heat are going to be. You know, you got Jimmy Butler, Bam out of bio. But it's all those other role players around there that are really going to make the difference in the past couple of years. It's been Tyler Hero and Duncan Robinson. And when they had Jay Crowder there in the bubble, he was a huge piece for them shooting that three ball. Um, but other than that, you really just, you don't know. You don't know. And you never know what a guy like Bradley Beal could, could add. Well, you do know what a guy like Bradley Beal could add is another great score, another great player in the NBA. But who are you going to give up and at what cost? Yep. I mean, sorry, our, our deal for Bradley Beal that centers around Tyler Hero, I'm not touching that. I am not touching that. That is an awful deal. There's so many more young stars that you could get than Tyler Hero. I mean, that guy, I've seen so many Shanghai Sharks jerseys with him. He should be sent over to, to China to play basketball. I'm not touching that deal. <laughs> I mean, Matt, you got a good point there. He, he is bubble boy, as a lot of people on the Twitter sphere like to call him, but uh, I, if, if all jokes aside, I think he stole his potential. I don't think he's going to be like a superstar or anything like that, but he still could be a pretty solid starter for you. I mean, Miami would have to give up a load of first round picks and pick swaps. So we'll have to see what happens there. But um, I think that kind of wraps up our NBA talk, unless anyone has any other comments. Oh, I was just going to throw it over to you guys fairly quickly to uh, give us some of the NHL signages before we throw in to go to the week. Um, NHL, I mean, there was a lot of stuff that happened. Way too much that we can go over right now really quickly. Dougie Hamilton to New Jersey, uh, seven years, $9.5 million deal. Seth Jones and Mark andre Fleury to Chicago. Chicago gave up a massive hole for a player who – really didn't play that well last year, in my opinion. And they gave up nothing for Marc-Andre Fleury. So I guess it kind of offsets him, uh, each other. Hopefully Fleury will actually play. It was, I, I want to see him play next to Patrick Kane. I mean, the Oilers botched the offseason. I mean, training for Duncan, Duncan Keith, no offense, man. I know he's one oh, of them. Awful. Yeah, no, he, he's awful. Awful contract. And they gave up a good defenseman in the third round pick to get him. So... I mean, Blackhawks were up and down. Kraken, what are you doing signing Groove Hour to six years, seven million when you just drafted uh, Drieger and Van Check? I mean, he, Groove Hour has had one elite year, and that was a, a big due part to Colorado's elite defense. Um, Matt, do, do you have anything else to say? 
I mean, the Kraken dealt Vancheck back to yeah. the Capitals for a, a third round pick, I think. Second, a second, round, a second round pick. But even even if at that point you're you're committing six or seven million dollars to a guy that really has not proven himself to be one of the top three or five goals yet, and he was playing b- behind the best team points wise in the league last year. Yeah, Mark Andre Fleury. I saw a report yesterday, kind of uh, getting into the Chicago vibe. I might play, uh, so we'll see that one. Um, Darcy Kemper signed to the Colorado Avalanche, one of my uh, favorite signings. You know, obviously to replace uh, Grubauer. Um, Avalanche also re-signed McCarr, re-signed uh, Landis Gog there. So they put their money towards those two players, but not Grubauer. And yeah, I mean that's that's all I could think of right now. Um, I, I'm going to give a shout out to Florida because they're resigning their guys. They, they got Sam Reinhardt for a pretty good uh, deal from Buffalo at first and a goaltending prospect who's actually, who actually played really well at the world juniors. They're, they're resigning all their guys to, to bridge deals to really see if they are, they are the guys. And if they actually continue to play like the way they did last year, all those deals are steals in my opinion, no pun intended, but uh they got to get Barkov done and Reinhardt done. That's all they have to uh, do this offseason. They're able to get Yandel and Strawman off their books. And I think if I'm forward to extend Barkov, extend Reinhardt, go look for a top four defenseman. But uh, I think that kind of wraps up this whole segment. This was a very long segment. There is so much to cover today. But hopefully you guys st- stuck around. And if you liked all of our analysis and what we have to say, please hit that like button. That helps us out a lot. And don't forget to subscribe. But other than that, we are going to head into our final segment right now. Go the week and we'll see you there. Welcome back to Go Chat. We are back to wrap up this episode with the Go of the Week. If you look at the leaderboard, I did win last week with the honest. I don't think that was really a question, to be honest. Did anyone else get a vote? Yeah, it was... Yeah, Connor did. Who could you have, Connor? No, no, Mike did. Mike did. Mike did. Mike did. Tatis. Tatis and Connor got one vote. Over for me or something. I always get one. It was seven, four to one. Of course, Tommy voted for you. He doesn't even. He doesn't know. He doesn't know. He doesn't know the athletes besides baseball, you know. Um, but we got another great go of the week for you this week. The Olympics are still going on. I hope to see three Olympians on this board. We'll see. All right, not not totally Olympians, but we'll see what we get here. Um, Mike, I'm going to throw it to you first. I am going with an, an Olympian, and is the second coming of Michael Phelps, Caleb Dressel. He is putting on an absolute show in every single swimming event uh, this Olympics. Men's 100-meter butterfly, gold. I'm pretty sure he set the world record for that. 100-meter freestyle, gold. 4 by 100 freestyle relay, gold. Uh, an- another relay, gold, 50 meter freestyle, set the Olympic re- record right there, gold. I mean, he's he's in line to compete with Michael Phelps for um, the most uh, medals in in Olympics, in in a single Olympics. And what he's doing right now is unprecedented, and hasn't been done in in history besides Michael Phelps. So he's at that level right now. And he's just swimming out of his mind. He's phenomenal, awesome dolphin kick, you know, great swimming analysis right there. But he does have a phenomenal dolphin kick. And that's what's really propelled him to five gold medals and more to come. He's got the most gold medals right now in Tokyo by uh, by a player. Yep. Great pick. Great pick, Mike. Loved watching uh, swimming at night. We loved watching him. Connor. It is great to see the Olympians in the United States and across the other countries doing so well, but I'm not going to go with an Olympian this week. I'm going to go with Cincinnati Reds first baseman, Joey Votto. He's been playing so, so good. You know, he, he, he's just like, he's way past his prime. And a lot of the MLB and MLB fans know that he's way past his prime, but in his last seven games, he hit eight home runs, including seven straight games with a home run. He hit 370 with a 471 on base percentage, eight home runs, 14 RBIs, nine runs, 10 hits. You know, I mean, 
This is something that we haven't seen from Joey Votto. And he came literally just inches short of, of tying the MLB record for eight straight games uh, a Saturday night against the Mets when he was so close to a home run, inches short from tying the MLB rec- record. Um, but yeah, I got to go with Joey Votto here. He's been playing out of his mind way past his prime, playing really good baseball, uh, showing a lot of people that you you can still do anything you want to do at a certain, certain age. Much like Phil Mickelson, who never wanted to go to the league, but I guess we'll never have to get into that again. Um, I'm going to go swing it back to the U.S. Olympics over there in Tokyo. I'm going to have to go to Alyssa Nair, the goaltender for the U.S. Women's National Team. U.S. Women's National Team uh, beat Netherlands, who they also matched up against in the 2019 World Cup Final. Netherlands, fantastic team. I think they're ranked second or third in the international rankings. But that game went into a penalty shootout. And let me tell you, that was one of the best games I've ever seen. One of the best performances I've ever seen from a goaltender. The U.S. won 4-2 to two in the, that shootout, or in the, the PKs. Alyssa Nayer saved two amazing PKs. And we swing it back to the 80th minute in the regulation. And Kelly O'Hara committed a penalty in the, the box. So there was a PK there. Alyssa Nayer with a great save. She practically put the team on her back. And it's the reason why they are playing Monday morning against uh, Canada Really excited to see what this U.S. team can do. They've really been underperforming. The U.S. in general have been underperforming in the Olympics. So uh, we'll have to see what the U.S. women's can do tomorrow. But um, Alyssa Nair is literally one of the greatest performances by a U.S. goaltender. And in a big stage like that, you just you love to see it. And I'm excited for the their game coming up. Three, ga- three great goats this week. Uh, I think that's going to wrap up. Our goat chat episode number ninety six is always hit that. Mike, do you have something to say? Well, well, I was, I was going to say, listen there. That performance reminded me of a uh, what what Don and Ruma did in the Euro. It's not Mike. Wow. What do you mean? You, you didn't watch game. the game, did you? What do you mean? I didn't watch the game. Did that was watch- eerily similar. No, oh, did you watch the U.S. women's game? That was not. It was not similar, Mike. She made amazing saves th- throughout the regulation. You're just trying to make it similar because the PKs. What do you mean? Donovan made phenomenal saves throughout regulation as well. I'm just saying that. that Mike, that, Mike that let me just bad. ask you. Did you watch the U.S. women's game? No, I didn't watch the U.S. So why are you saying it's I really- watched the highlights, though. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We're, we're going to wrap it up here before I Mike. I want to shout out another one. Mike embarrasses himself. Jason Tatum dropping 27 points on Czech Republic. He's showing out, and he could have been my goal. We're going to wrap up. Oh, wait, no, no. Shout out Katie Ledecky, though. Yeah, Katie yeah, Ledecky. yeah. When you said next coming to Michael Phelps, I thought we were going to be talking about Katie Ledecky. She's she's incredible, too. It was, it was well. She's insane. She, I thought about going for her go of the week. But now I'll wrap it up, Connor. As always, hit the like button, comment below. Um, what was your favorite acquisition over this acquisition period, whether it be MLB, NBA, NHL? Um Hit the subscribe button. We'll be back next week with Go Chat episode number 97. We're getting so close to that episode 100. We can't wait to hit that. We're all going to be back in Ithaca to hit that. We'll have Tommy back. You know, we're hoping to do something special there. But until then, just continue to follow. We really do appreciate it. Hit the like button, follow, subscribe, do everything that you guys have been doing. We really appreciate it. And we'll see you guys next week.